Welcome to josephsmithspolygamy.org, the audio version. Reasons given by Joseph Smith for the restoration of polygamy. Joseph Smith identified four reasons for the restoration of plural marriage, with the fourth being much more important than the others. Number one, as part of the restitution of all things prophesied in Acts 3, 19-21. The earliest justification mentioned by the prophet for the reestablishment of Old Testament polygamy was as a part of the restitution of all things prophesied in Acts. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. This need for restoration is mentioned in section 132. I am the Lord thy God. I have conferred upon you the keys and powers of the priesthood, wherein I restore all things. Verse 40, see also verse 45. Joseph saw himself as a restorationist, and the Lord declared him so in regards to priesthood authority and salvific ordinances. Apparently, Joseph also came to the conclusion that polygamy was a thing that could be restored. The need to restore this ancient marital order, because it was practiced in the past by some of God's prophets, was apparently the only explanation given in Kirtland, Ohio, in the mid-1830s. Benjamin F. Johnson recalled in 1903, In 1835 at Kirtland, I learned from my sister's husband, Lyman R. Sherman, who was close to the prophet and received it from him, that the ancient order of plural marriage was again to be practiced by the church. A few years later, in 1841, Joseph Smith attempted to broach the topic publicly. Helen Mar Kimball remembered, He, Joseph, astonished his hearers by preaching on the restoration of all things and said that, as it was anciently with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so it would be again. Similarly, Joseph A. Kelting recalled his personal conversation with Joseph Smith. Calling at the house of the prophet one day early in the spring of 1844 on some business or other not now remembered, the prophet invited me into a room upstairs in his house called the mansion. After we entered the room, he locked the door and then asked me if I had heard the rumors connecting him with polygamy. I told him I had. He then began a defense of the doctrine by referring to the Old Testament. I told him I did not want to hear that as I could read it for myself. He claimed to be a prophet. I believed him to be a prophet, and I wanted to know what he had to say about it. He expressed some doubts as to how I might receive it and wanted to know what stand I would take if I should not believe what he had to say about it. I then pledged him my word that whether I believed his revelation or not, I would not betray him. He then informed me that he had received a revelation from God which taught the correctness of the doctrine of a plurality of wives and commanding him to obey it. He acknowledged to having married several wives. I told him that was all right. He then said he would like a further pledge from me that I would not betray him. I asked him if he wanted me to accept the principle by marrying a plural wife. He answered yes. A short time after this, I married two wives in that order of marriage. It wasn't until eight years after Joseph's death that earthly plural marriage as a necessary element in the Restoration was formally addressed. Orson Pratt explained some of the reasoning behind the Restoration of Plural Marriage when he presented the concept to the general membership of the Church in 1852. In explaining the doctrine to the congregation, he started by recounting the first eternal marriage that of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They were immortal beings, therefore their marriage was eternal. In the final dispensation of time, all things needed to be restored. Thus, eternal marriage needed to be restored because that ordinance had been lost. Here was offered some much-needed clarification on what 
essential ordinance needed to be restored as part of the restitution of all things. It was eternal marriage of which plural marriage was simply a type, sometimes divinely sanctioned. Number two, to provide a customized trial for the saints of that time and place. Another reason for the establishment of plural marriage is that it brought trials to practicing saints that provided opportunities for spiritual growth. In an 1831 revelation, Joseph Smith taught the value of tribulations. Ye cannot behold with your natural eyes, for the present time, the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter, and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. For after much tribulation come the blessings, Wherefore, the day cometh that ye shall be crowned with much glory. The hour is not yet, but is nigh at hand. DNC 58 verses 3 and 4 The belief that God challenges his followers on earth in order to make them worthy of blessings from their obedience is a pattern in the scriptures. Sometimes adherents are required to migrate to new lands or to defend themselves against powerful enemies. Missionary work has been universally commanded of God's people in every age, bringing blessings to those who would open their mouths. D.N.C. 33, 8-10. Compare section 60, verse 2. Joseph Smith's revelations promised the early saints that they would be endowed with power from on high if they would build a temple. D.N.C. 38, 32, and 38 and their obedience was richly rewarded. The command to practice plural marriage was a similar challenge. One of Joseph's plural wives, Helen Mar Kimball, remembered, The prophet said that the practice of this principle would be the hardest trial the saints would ever have to test their faith. She also recalled, I did not try to conceal the fact of its having been a trial, but confessed that it had been one of the severest of my life but that it had also proven one of the greatest blessings. I could truly say it had done the most towards making me a saint and a free woman, in every sense of the word, and I knew many others who could say the same, and to whom it had proven one of their greatest boons, a blessing in disguise. Apostle John Taylor summarized, Where did this commandment come from in relation to polygamy? And then he answered, It also came from God. It was a revelation given unto Joseph Smith from God, and was made binding upon his servants. When this system was first introduced among this people, it was one of the greatest crosses that ever was taken up by any set of men since the world stood. Brigham Young recalled in 1855, I foresaw when Joseph first made known this doctrine that it would be a trial, and a source of great care and anxiety to the brethren. And what of that? We are to gird up our loins and fulfill this just as we would any other duty. For plural wife Martha Cragen Cox, plural marriage led to intense prayers that brought inspiration. I knew the principle of plural marriage to be correct, to be the highest, holiest order of marriage, I knew, too, that I might fail to live the holy life required and lose the blessings offered. If I had not learned before to go to the Lord with my burden, I surely learned to go to Him now. I found relief only in prayer when the Holy Spirit gave me inspiration. That the practice of plural marriage would be a trial bringing blessings is inferred in several verses of the Revelation on Celestial and Plural Marriage found in section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants. In three places it refers to Abraham's obedience and the blessings he received. Verses 36, 50 through 51. Regarding Joseph Smith, who entered his first plural union in April 1841, The July 1843 revelation states, Behold, I have seen your sacrifices and will forgive all your sins. I have seen your sacrifices in obedience to that which I have told you. Go, therefore, and I make a way for your escape, as I accepted the offering of Abraham of his son Isaac. Verse 50, see also 60. The trial was withdrawn through the 1890 Manifesto. 
At that time, Wilfred Woodruff, the holder of the sealing keys to authorized all valid eternal marriages, declared the commandment to practice plural marriage to be no longer binding upon the saints. They were to live monogamy like Book of Mormon saints. Fourteen years later, in 1904, Church President Joseph F. Smith stopped allowing new plural marriages. While he was an apostle, Joseph F. Smith explained, There is a great deal said about our plural marriage. It is a principle that pertains to eternal life, in other words, to endless lives or eternal increase. It is a law of the gospel pertaining to the celestial kingdom, applicable to all gospel dispensations when commanded and not otherwise, and neither acceptable to God or binding on man unless given by commandment, not only so given in this dispensation, but particularly adapted to the conditions and necessities thereof and to the circumstances, responsibilities, and personal as well as vicarious duties of the people of God in this age of the world. Despite the sincerity and convictions of many modern polygamists, they are not authorized, so their plural unions are not valid. See Doctrine and Covenants 132, verse 18. Number three, multiplying and replenishing the earth. The third reason given by Joseph Smith for the practice of plural marriage comes as polygamous couples multiply and replenish the earth. Through those marriages, additional devout families are created into which noble and great premortal spirits can be born. See Abraham 3.22. The revelation on celestial marriage states, They, the plural wives, are given unto him their husband to multiply and replenish the earth according to my commandment, that they may bear the souls of men. Section 132, verse 63. It might be observed that the more wives and children that a man has, the less personal time he has to spend with each one. Accordingly, his direct influence is paradoxically diluted. Unfortunately, some authors have portrayed sexual reproduction to multiply and replenish the earth as the primary reason for plural marriage. They imply that Joseph Smith's libido was a driving force in the establishment of polygamy among the Latter-day Saints. One author went so far as to write, Celestial marriage was all about sex and children. Another proclaimed, The intent of Smith's doctrine is clear, to reproduce and provide bodies for children. These assessments are incomplete and potentially misleading. Multiplying and replenishing the earth was one of several reasons for the restoration of polygamy, but it is not the most important. The fourth reason is eternally consequential and therefore vastly more significant, and it does not require sexuality on earth. Number four, to allow all worthy women to be sealed to an eternal husband for their exaltation in the eternal worlds. The Revelation on Celestial and Plural Marriage, section 132, explains the fourth reason why polygamy may have been restored. It begins with Joseph prayerfully inquiring to know and understand wherein I, the Lord, justified my servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as also Moses, David, and Solomon, my servants, as touching the principle and doctrine of their having many wives and concubines. Section 132, verse 1. Clearly, the opening question is about polygamy, but that subject is not mentioned again until verse 34, and multiply and replenish is not mentioned until verse 63. Instead, in what seems to be an almost random shift of topics, the revelation quickly emphasizes the need for priesthood authority to seal together things on earth so they will be together after death. And verily I say unto you that the conditions of this law are these. All covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations that are not made and entered into and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise of him who is anointed both as well for time and for all eternity, and that too most holy, 
by revelation and commandment through the medium of mine anointed, whom I have appointed on this earth to hold this power. And I have appointed unto my servant Joseph to hold this power in the last days. And there is never but one on the earth at a time on whom this power and the keys of this priesthood are conferred, are of no efficacy, virtue, or force in and after the resurrection from the dead. For all contracts that are not made unto this end have an end when men are dead. Section 132, verse 7. This immediate diversion to discuss priesthood power suggests that the primary reason for a plurality of wives, even in Old Testament times, is complicated and may transcend the simple commandment to multiply and replenish the earth. Verses 7 through 20 outline what might be considered the zenith doctrine taught by Joseph Smith, eternalized marriage and deification. Ironically, this remarkable theological concept has nothing directly to do with plural marriage, even though it was given in response to a question about it. The Blessing of Eternal Marriage Brigham Young acknowledged that marriage relation, rather than plurality, is the thread which runs from the beginning to the end in God's plan for his children. The whole subject of marriage, bracket, not plural marriage, bracket, relation is not in my reach, nor in any other man's reach on this earth. It is without beginning of days or end of years. It is a hard matter to reach. We can tell some things with regard to it. It lays the foundation for worlds, for angels, and for gods, for the intelligent beings to be crowned with glory, immortality, and eternal lives. In fact, it is the thread which runs from the beginning to the end of the holy gospel of salvation, of the gospel of the Son of God. It is from eternity to to eternity. To read more about Joseph Smith's theology regarding eternal marriage, check out Joseph Smith's Polygamy Toward a Better Understanding.